converging technologies for me is really about an opportunity, and it's an opportunity to be surprised and, and really delighted in what can come about when people with, with a, uh, a broad range of experience come together. In, in my laboratory, I usually talk about the Eureka moment. And historically, the Eureka moment was when, you know, the lone scientist was, was thinking by him or herself, and all of a sudden, you know, boom, a, a, a fantastic idea came out of nowhere, mm -hmm. and people, you know, that person was running around uh, talking about the idea. But, but nowadays, you know, it's very, very hard for a single person to have a Eureka moment. I mean, when it usually happens nowadays, it seems to me is when people with very different experience and who are both extremely deep in their fields come together, learn how to communicate, and all of a sudden they start to realize that working together they can solve a problem that they couldn't have solved working individually, and perhaps no one person could have solved in individually. Well, uh, you know, in my work, I'm, I'm in the computer area, uh, IT in general, and for us, the converging technologies are all about getting from, from the, 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 the type of technology uh, roadmap that we've been on for literally the last 40 years and, and getting up to a new level. I mean, we're looking for a quantum leap. And so there, the, the, the concept is really to start understanding how to bring in the ideas that have been developing over the past several decades in psychology and in uh, uh, neurology and, and bring them into our software and our hardware to make our uh, uh, IT systems, our computers and, and our networking systems uh, uh, exponentially more powerful than, they, than they've ever been before. I mean, we think that this is really possible because we can just look at the brain as an example of a, a type of computing machine which is perhaps a million times more efficient uh, in, in terms of at least doing some functions uh, than our computers are today. Now, there's other functions uh, you know, that, that our brains don't do very well, but, uh, but actually most of the computing that's going on today, we talk about cloud computing and we talk about searches and we talk about uh, uh, various types of algorithms for, for making decisions. Those algorithms don't really require the calculation of a number to 50 significant figures. You know, we're not trying to, to, to balance a budget, we're trying to make a decision. And so that type of, of, of computing uh, really is, a, is a, a, you know, a different paradigm from, what we're, from the machines that we're building now. And so I think that we can benefit tremendously by incorporating uh, the lessons learned in the uh, you know, bio-inspired areas uh, uh, to uh, really update and, and uh, create new types of architectures for our hardware and platforms for our software. So the, you know, so the applications of the uh, types of uh, uh, bio-inspired algorithms that I'm, I'm looking at are especially having to do with uh, uh, analyzing, uh, call it multi-sensory types of data. I mean, if you think about uh, uh, you know, the world around you, uh, there are so many things going on that you'd like to be aware of uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense. And so, for instance, we have an aging infrastructure, our cities, our roads, our buildings, our pipelines of various sorts, our, our uh, uh, cables that, that, that communicate uh, uh, information or, or conduct energy. They're, they're all aging, they're all starting to, to come apart in various ways. And what we'd like to be able to do is, is be monitoring them full time without having to have people continuously running up and down and checking every little piece of the problem. So, you know, one way of doing that is by using cameras, by using other types of sensors, either very sensitive microphones, uh, very sensitive accelerometers, chemical sensors. Think about these as the analogs of the human senses, but instead of trying to have uh, you know, some huge number of human beings 24-7 monitoring all of this infrastructure, you have those uh, uh, information sensors uh, uh, conveying the, the, the information to one of these uh, cognitive computing systems, and it is continuously looking at this inflow of data, especially visual data, comparing it with data that have been uh, archived and, and saved in the past, and essentially flagging uh, things that, that uh, uh, might be a, a worry, essentially alerting the human being that here is a situation that, 
that has never occurred before, or here's a situation that has occurred in the past and it's been correlated with the problem. And so you should actually go out and check this uh, at, at this time to make it a very timely uh, 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 analysis of, of the uh, data stream coming in. So, th so the biggest obstacle for converging technologies is really communication. I mean, you have this wonderful idea of people who are extremely deep in different fields talking to each other, but the problem is that they're always speaking different languages, and that different language is usually English. And so, you know, you, you get tricked. You get fooled by the fact that you're actually sort of using the same language, but in fact, people in, in, in different disciplines have, have taken concepts which are similar, but they use very different words, very different English words to describe those concepts. Or, even worse, they have taken the same English word and they use it to mean completely different concepts. And so what usually happens when people like this come together is they usually start arguing <clears throat> because, you know, somebody will say a word and it will bring a picture in the other person's mind which is completely different uh, from, the, from, from the intent. And so usually it, it winds up being an issue of figuring out what's the context. Uh, and, and, and also it, it requires uh, a desire on the parts of both people to be uh, communicative and to have some level of trust that this other person is a domain expert. They really know what they're talking about, but if, if it sounds strange to you, that probably means that they're just using words in a different way than you would use those same words. So, you know, you know it, it, it requires, as I said, you have to have some trust and you have to have the, the fortitude, if you will, to sort of break through the communications barriers, figure out what it is that the person is actually saying, translate that into your own language, and then be able to build from there. And for me, in, in, in my particular laboratory, uh, that has been consistently the biggest challenge that we always face. It took us actually uh, at least two years uh, when we first constituted the lab for people to just to be able to even begin conversations with each other and it was maybe after three or four years of almost continual uh, headbutting against each other that they finally started realizing hey that person over there is actually pretty smart and I really ought to be uh, uh, you know talking with them more about uh, uh, some of these ideas that I've got to see uh, how we can work together to solve problems.